I guess the thing that really strikes me is the incredible variety of music coming out of this town. I mean, it's really pretty hard to define the Minneapolis sound because there are so many distinctly different sounds here. Cash register is ringing. I think that's the sound of coins dropping into the cash register. I just say it's a print sound because I think that's where it all began. And everybody's taken different pieces of it and incorporated it into their own sound. There's a lot of them. There's not just one. People are looking for the Loch Ness Monster, too. I see so many national groups now that I hear the Minneapolis sound. There's a lot of groups with the Minneapolis sound. Unfortunately, <coughs> they don't have that chili sauce or that bacon grease, but they're doing good. <laughs> Hello, I'm Toussaint Morrison. Welcome to Minnesota Experience. So for the first time in 30 years, we're broadcasting Minneapolis Sound, a documentary that looks into the local music scene in the 80s, produced by Emily Goldberg. Hello. And we're also here with Bianca Rhodes, daughter of Minneapolis drummer Jellybean, who played with? The Time. The Time. Emily Prince is in this documentary, yet he's not lively interviewed in the, uh, in the video at all. I tried, I tried, I yeah. tried so hard, yeah. um, but no, he just, I just think he, don't think he was interested in being on TV. You know, at that point, he'd only given that one interview with Rolling Stone oh, really? um, with my friend Neil Carlin. Yeah, it was okay. called Prince Speaks. You know, it was like a big <laughs> deal. It was a big deal because he didn't speak. You know, that was kind of his, a lot of his shroud of secrecy and mystery, I think, that made, was part of his appeal. So did it ever get annoying at all having a father as a drummer playing all the time you know, in the kitchen. It was really fun for me to mm -hmm. see him just love music like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, getting to see him on like Saturday Night Live wow. and Arsenio Hall, where I get to stay up late. That was my yeah, thing. Yeah. It was like, Daddy's on TV. <laughs> Turn the TV on, I get to watch it. Yeah. She was only, let's point out, she was only six, was only when, six this when this came documentary came out. Oh, wow. Was there any part of you going into the, into the documentary that felt, you know, some hesitance? No, I was really excited. And I was really excited to tell this story um, because it hadn't really been told. I mean, I think the nervousness was with some, you know, just trying to connect with people. And, you know, I even had trouble getting the replacements. You know, it's like it was hard yeah. to get people to agree to do it. And, and also figuring out who to leave in, who to put in and who to leave out because the uh. scene is so huge. That was the hard part. And that's a lot of why I included myself in it because yeah. I really did want it to be not the Bible of right. the Minneapolis music scene, but yeah. just one person's take on it. When I say Minneapolis, what do you think of? Boring. Nothing. Farmland. Boring. Snow. Land of 10,000 lakes. Boredom. Mini, 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 small. Opolis city, right? So like it's a small city, so Minneapolis. Ew, I wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> Terrible. So freezing. Dull. Cold weather, bad cars. Minneapolis seems like like I might as well be Siberian, you know, to me. Anyway, the point is, somewhere around 1984 or so, Minneapolis became important enough in the pop music world to take its place next to Motown on the proverbial musical map. There's Jam and Lewis and all of those guys from the time. Plus, there's Husker Du, The Replacements, The Jets. Yes, yes. So I figure we should probably start out at Paisley Park and get the South stuff done first, and then we can um, head up to First Avenue after lunch. And then <clears> I think we'll have plenty this of This is the story of one woman's search for the Minneapolis sound. Oh, that is so corny. Okay, all I have to say is that I set out to talk to musicians and fans and critics here and on the coast to try to find out what all the hype is about and to see if I could come up with some sort of definition of the Minneapolis sound and then we can cut to a Prince video. I think he stinks. Prince makes me wince. He's very, very gifted. One of the most gifted pop musicians of the decade. Possibly the most gifted pop musician of the decade. 
Purple rain, purple rain. <laughs> Are you a Prince fan? Yeah, big fan. I mean, a lot of people say I resemble him a little bit. Well, I played ball with Prince in Central High School. You know he's yay tall, but he jumps like a high man. That's the truth. Anybody will tell you that. Prince, a very talented man. Uh, uh, he could be the next king. I, I do not know. Hi, is this Paisley Park? Yeah. Hi, my name is Emily Goldberg, and I'm calling from Channel 2. I'm producing a documentary on the Minneapolis music scene, and I'm interested in talking with Prince about his impressions of... Oh, uh-huh. And he, he, he doesn't make any exceptions at all? Okay, well, thanks anyway. First thing I noticed about Prince, besides that he was talented, that at, the, at uh, you know, there would always be, for drummers, there was always a certain beat that if you knew that beat, you were the good drummer. And a long time ago, it was like, do, got to, got to do, got to do, got to do, 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 do. You know, everybody knew that. You were bad if you could play that. If you were a piano player, you had to know something like Color My World, you know, or Benny and the Jets or something like that. Or you, I could play Benny and the Jets. I was the hit of the school, you know. Everybody loved that. If you were a guitar player, the solo to play at the time was the solo in Make Me Smile by Chicago. Prince could play that solo note for note. So to me, he was the baddest guitar player around because he could wear that solo out on Make Me Smile. There was a chap in town called Owen Husney who had been doing some work at the studio with me. Uh, nice chap, I owned an ad agency. So I went over to see Owen. I said, Owen, I, I said, I've got the next Stevie Wonder. Every day I'd come in and he'd say, I've got the next Stevie Wonder, I've got the next Stevie Wonder. I'd say, thanks. Sounds great, but I'll see in an hour, which I never did. So I said, no, really. He's the next Stevie Wonder. I said, here's the tape. Listen to it. See what you think. And I put in this tape, and I was, like had goosebumps. I said, oh, my God, who's the group? And he said, well, you better sit down. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's one kid playing all the instruments and singing all the voices and doing everything on there. And that one kind of looked at me incredulous, and he plays all the instruments. I said, he does, he does. You, you won't believe it. It's amazing. <laughs> and I looked at him, you know, I had my business face on, and I said, well, does he live here? Can I, can I see him here? Uh, we had three labels in, the, in a bidding war, which was A&M Records, CBS, and Warner Brothers Records. I am aware that he's only granted one TV interview in the last three years. He just simply does not give But, but this is interviews. public television, and I thought that he I would... Care. I mean, Prince, would, um, Prince couldn't be here tonight, but he would like to say thank you very much to all his fans, and he loves you very much. Thank you. Every time we read a Prince story on the news, I kind of look in the camera and say, Prince, call me. Please, talk to me. Be a guy. But he never does. See? Pat, Pat Miles saw him at the movie the other day, sat next to him. He wouldn't even talk to her. She was crushed. She was crushed. Okay, then I won't take it personally. Anyway, it, it's not like there weren't plenty of other stars of the Minneapolis music scene around, many of whom are as important as Prince in terms of drawing national attention to the area, and a lot less shy. Thank God. Okay, how much you need? <laughs> This was hot, a reunion of the time, the short-lived but extremely popular band that Prince helped put together. This band made a star out of lead singer Morris Day and got people around the country excited about something called the Minneapolis Sound. Everybody walk your body. Dancing in one place are gone. Honey, you know you can't dance with them tight jeans on. If you try to cop a dip, you trip, slip and fall. Walking's for the cool, baby. Put on the camera song. Hey! Everybody walk your body. Everybody walk your body. Everybody walk. I would say that they're probably, arguably, the best band of the 80s in the sense that they played very well together. They had a very great look and a very great style and all these elements that, that make a band exciting. And I think that they broke up before they ever really reached their potential. What time is it? I think Morris Day was a very influential performer, as much as Prince was. 
I mean, you see guys who try and be Prince and, and Morris Day sometimes out there, right? It's really, it's really interesting. What do they come out like? Not too good, <laughs> especially out of L.A. There's a lot of real fake Minneapolis people in Los Angeles. Hi, this is Morris Day. He used to live in Minneapolis. Now he lives in Minnesota. I'm getting ready to move out to this raggedy. And we, raggedy, and see, we would have been neighbors and things, but he moved in my neighborhood after I after moved. he left. Or else I would have stayed and things. Because it couldn't be two stars in the same neighborhood. But actually, there could have been, you know. Yeah. But see, but then we'd always been buying bigger cars. Buy bigger I'll do cars, the other one. See, I'll do the other one. We'd be you broke. Know, we'd be broke. I'm broke now because I'm still in Minneapolis, so I got to move out here to make some money. And I'm broke because I'm out here and it's expensive to live out here, see? And we gone. <laughs> I was out here finishing up Purple Rain, and it was like close to Christmas, and it was like 75 degrees, and I was staying on the, on the beach at the Sheraton Miramar, overlooking the water. And I called home, and my mom said it was about 60 degrees below zero with the windshield. And I said, send my stuff. Let's role play back. Camera A, camera B. I'm actually from Springfield, Illinois. I was born there, we lived in the projects there. And then we moved in, um, to Minneapolis and, and you know, my mom got better jobs. My mom raised, you know, me and my brother and sister. And um, my point is, I guess you would say that we were kind of poor. But I guess poor is a state of the mind, right? Because I felt rich. I never knew that, you know, we were lacking, you know, in the money department. I had a bicycle and everything I needed, you know. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Yeah. So how old were you when you moved to Minneapolis? About somewhere between four and six, you know, we'll approximately. Say, we'll say five. But five is cool. <laughs> now, now, when did you get interested in music? Were you always interested in music? Yeah, you know, I, I used to um, listen to the radio, and, and, and I think the song I can remember is the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. I'd be grooving to that. And then James Brown, uh, let me see, what was it? What was that song? I, I can't remember, but, you know, I'd be running around the house in my drawers doing the James Brown and doing the splits. Yeah, I, I used to be able to dance when I was a kid, you know. Now I can just cool dance. But I can't dance like I used to. When it comes to dancing, I'm the best. Believe it or not, what you probably don't believe, see? When I was in school, I didn't have no women chasing me or nothing like that, see? But then I got in a band. We formed a group and things changed. What band was that? That was Grand Central. That was me and Prince and Andre Simone and a, a few other buddies of mine. And, and things got drastically different. See, I had a circle. You know. That's quite a circle. That crowd grew to include the other yeah, members remember, of the time. Uh, you know, all, uh, you know, why don't we go back people. to that old time footage for a second? Um. Okay, that's Jesse Johnson on guitar. He's gone on to a successful solo career. And then there's Jam and Lewis. Jimmy Jam Harris is the guy on keyboards, and that's Terry Lewis playing bass. They're now Flight Time Productions, Grammy Award-winning producers who, like Prince, still live and work in Minneapolis. I remember when Terry found the building, Terry found this building, he said, he said, it's on 43rd and Nicholas. And I said, see, I can say that now, because see, we're not going to be here when this airs. So everybody's going to be going, oh, really? Ha ha, we're not there anymore. Okay, so um, I said, 43rd and Nicholas, I, said, I used to walk by there every day to go into school. I went to Washburn High School, and I used to walk by every day. So I knew the neighborhood, remembered the hardware store and the mortuary. They never go out of business. But this building, I didn't remember. So you can start in the front room, you can start in the Hi, hallway. I'm David Leatherman. <laughs> right, no, this is what this reminds me of. This is like David Letterman when the guy's falling around again. Right. Okay, uh, along the wall, this is like our our Hall of Fame, right? And if you go along these walls here, we start with the origins, of course, the time. What time is it? All that stuff. What time is it? Little cute guitar player, make your mama proud. We move into the our newer stuff, the Human League. I'm human. Herb Alpert. New Alexander O'Neill. Patty Austin, Robert Palmer, so on and so forth. The list goes on and on. 
And of course, who could forget Janet Jackson? Control. You guys aren't fast enough. We have to get a shot. Hang on. Well, let's just a one of my best friend and business partner, Mr. Terry Lewis. Mr. Terry Lewis is here at the mailbox. Me and Terry were aware of each other. This is in junior high. We got together, we did a couple gigs. Terry went off and formed Flight Time. I went off in a few different bands. And then we got to a point where Terry was playing, I was DJing at the Fox Trap, a club called the Fox Trap, which is now Jukebox Saturday Night or whatever. Um, I was spinning records upstairs, his band was playing downstairs. He'd come up and watch me spin, I'd go down and watch the band play. So it was like, we were always like this. We even tried to get together a couple times and write some songs, but it didn't work because I was so into this melodic singing group thing, and he was into the P-funk, funkadelic, serious, you know, we just were, cla we clashed. Didn't work. And, uh, you know, eventually, I think that's what, what did work between us, was that our influences were so different that we finally, at, at some point, got mature enough to figure out how to mesh them together to make a, a good sound. This is our piano here, Yamaha. This is where we create all our great songs like Let's Wait a While and, uh, uh, gee, what else did we <laughs> head out? It's more of a Jam and Lewis style than a Jam and Lewis sound because there's a style in which I play keyboards that I can't, I can only really play one way. There's a style in which Terry plays bass. There's a style of, of lyrics that Terry likes to do. No, my first name ain't baby, it's Janet. Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. We consciously try to switch. According to who we do, we switch into totally different gears. And there's certain sounds that we reserve for certain artists. And we really watch to see if a song starts sounding like another artist's song. A lot of times we'll draw the line. But they can have a duplicate. Nope, you gotta on on imitate and perpetrate. You need to put a big T on like imitate. Okay, a big T. On that and perpetrate. Create. Oh, imitate and perpetrate. Imitate, yeah, right. That's it. Imitrate. Yeah, imitrate. <laughs> This is the spot that Janet Jackson stood in, and Philip Oakey when we did the Human League album, and a new edition stood in this spot, and a lot of famous people stood in this spot. What about the Pia Zadora album? That's coming very soon. I understand it's great. Uh, I hope it is. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's really good. I'm, I'm really happy. Is it easier to be famous here than it is in New York or L.A. in terms of your life? Uh, I think so, because I'm a normal guy. You know, I'm, I, I don't have bodyguards, and I go eat at restaurants, and I mean, I, I don't do anything too much out of the ordinary. Thanks a lot. I appreciate no you problem. coming on the Arts and Entertainment Show on KSTP. All right, KSTP 1500. All right. But I think it's nice to have nice, regular people like me, and people can just say, hey, I seen Jimmy Jam at the movie, or I seen him at the restaurant. Hi, Jimmy. And they can walk in. I say, hi, how you doing? You know, and whatever. That's nice. I think people like that. I think they feel that they're more a part of it. Them. And now we turn the corner into our reception. We have some new wallpaper going in. If we can get a shot of our new wallpaper, we plan on decorating the whole place like this. Isn't that nice? I thought you'd like this. Didn't know we were athletic, did you? Yes, we are. As a matter of fact, we are the 1987 Class A Touch Football runner-ups. That's right, Flight Time Productions. Ever seen a Grammy in your life? Not very impressive, is it? It's actually even, do you know on a Grammy that this actually screws off? What do you know? Oops, what do you know about that? Yes, don't try this at home, kids. We do this because we love it. 
you know, not because we want somebody to say, oh, you're great, you know, none of that. You know. It doesn't hurt. It's nice. Hey, it's, I, hey, I love it. I mean, I think it's nice. It's nice to be appreciated. It really is. It's nice to do something positive. And it's nice now when you do something positive that is something that other people can share in the success with you, where the state can pat itself on the back and go, hey, these guys are from here. Hey, that's great. I like that. Let's go play some ping pong. Here we go. Number one, we have the refrigerator. Notice there is no alcoholic. Sparkling cider, ladies and gentlemen, sparkling cider. There is no alcohol in this refrigerator. We do not drink. We do not do drugs. That's why I got money to spend on Ferrari. Save a lot of money if you don't mess with them drugs, let me tell you. This is another reason I have a lot of money, the pool table. Actually, this is the reason I lost money. I cannot shoot. For the camera. Take two. OK. Ping pong we have here. Notice the echo in this room. We actually do hand claps in this room. You believe that? On uh, hearsay. Listen to the hand claps on hearsay. See if you can pick mine out. It, it is in there. And uh, of course, the back door. Hey, come on out here. I got something to show you. Boy, isn't it cold out here? I don't know whether you can see this. My Range Rover. This is something we like to do when it's not. Now, this is. I don't know what month this is airing, but you can tell that it is winter outside. We do play basketball, something we enjoy very much. And that is my uh, tour of Flight Time Productions. Thank you very much. We're looking at an Alexander O'Neill record that went gold within seven and a half weeks. We're looking for a platinum album in the next month or two. Alex, one of the, Alex is one of the hottest artists we have on the label right now. Six months ago when we started this, or whatever it was, I told Alex that we'd have this. <laughs> now we got it tonight, and all I can say is, thank you! <laughs> Devil, thank you! I really love you guys, thank you. It's good to be home. Thank you. Although Alexander O'Neill didn't grow up with Prince, he did cross paths with him, apparently the wrong way. Originally, it was supposed to be Alexander, not Morris Day, who was going to be the lead singer of the time. But Alex and Prince had a little falling out, and Alex was, as he puts it, kicked out of the purple regime. It wasn't until years later, when he hooked up with his friends Jam and Lewis, that Alex had his first gold record. I feel those warm rays reaching out from her. She touched me with a smile that glows And I can't go a day without my A lot of times the kids come, you know, they hear the music And they say, is that Alexander O'Neill? I said, yes. For real? Yes. I don't believe it. I said, what it is. Then they put up, their, they wager their little money on bets, you know. I always win. But then I give him back that money. <laughs> hey, hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. What's up? What's up? Yeah, damn. Hey, you know. See me somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Exactly. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, when he hey, first was doing his up? first recording to get it started, he started here. And he never he forgot that. Right? He always came back. And this is why I think that he isn't in a hurry to leave it because it is home. And it is what made him grow into what he is now. Well, actually, you know, I had never really tried to get off into performing because I always thought that sports would be my claim to fame. Uh, I wanted to be a professional athlete. And for some reason, uh, singing and 
playing football didn't actually mesh, you know. So um, I uh, shied away from my singing gift, but it was something I always did, even when I went to college and everything. I used to sing in the showers and stuff like that, and all the fellows would say, this guy can really sing, and I would be like, get out of here, you know, I'm a football player, you know. And, uh, but it wasn't, I, I didn't really get serious about it until uh, I moved uh, here to Minneapolis to the Twin Cities in 1974. It's Alex, really? I uh, used to play at uh, a club called uh, Sylvia's on Cedar, which is now Club Cedar. And that was like my regular playing place, you know? And I would pass by Mickey's Diner every night to work, you know? And I say, one day, when I have when I have the opportunity to have, you know, a national album, I'm going to take a picture in front of Mickey's Diner, and it's going to be the joint, right? From my understanding, someone told me that they, they put an Alexander Burger up on the menu <laughs> after that. So, I mean, I thought it was really kind of flattering to have a burger named after you. Here you don't really have a lot of excuses for not being the best you that you can be. It's very cold in the winter time. You don't, you know, there's not a lot to do. So you spend more time indoors creating music. I mean, where's that thing? Where's the thing? I need the thing. Give me that thing. Can I get some nasty bass? It's gonna be kind of right tonight. I'm going to open up a chain of shoe stores right here in Minneapolis starting 1988. So hopefully in about 40 or something, I'll be able to sit back in a little pot and say, hey, oh. And when somebody says Alexander O'Neill, I'll be the first one with my shades on and my old man hat to say, Alexander who? Because I don't want to remember either, you know. I'd like to, my goal, Emily, is actually to put about 10 years into the music industry and get out. I want to be one of those artists who can get out, not one who has to be kicked out, because you always need a hit record, because your, your ego says, I need a hit record. I want to have had enough hit records and enough success and seen enough in life to feel good about my life, because I'd like to smell the roses each and every day. I try to, and I do. Alexander O'Neill, how was it interviewing him? And then also, what is what is he doing now? You know what he's doing now. He's in London. Okay. He's still very much involved in the music scene okay. to a certain degree. Europe loves Alex. And they always have. And I they think they even kept, at that time. It was like, they kept that man. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. okay. he, I mean, the, being in that basement with him, that basement yeah. of the hair salon, which I just love that whole mm -hmm. story because it's story. so local and lovely yes. Yes. and small, you know. and. Um, it was just amazing. I mean, that voice is mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> so beautiful, really, really beautiful. Yeah. So it was, it was great, you know, spending time with him and interviewing. He never took the shades off, so I don't know what was really going on back then. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a flight time. That's, that's a flight time Jimmy thing. Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sauce yeah, thing yeah, yeah. S'mores. So it's been 30 years. What is Jelly Bean doing now? He still tours with The Time. The Time still tours. Mm -hmm. He's finishing an album, and he's also playing with a lot of different Prince-inspired or pieces of the all-star type teams mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and about uh, around the world. So he's wow. still very, very, very active. So yeah. you you must have met everybody, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, Like, so, you've met Prince. Yeah, so these, it's the Purple family. They're like my uncles. Like, mm -hmm. that's how they've been referred to my entire life. Mm -hmm. It was like an adventure listening to uh, Rhythm Nation and stuff like mm -hmm. that, like right before the rest of the world would hear it, um, because yeah. that's Flight Time production. He he played on Rhythm Nation. Or? He Black Cat is my father's song. Wow. Black Cat is my father's song. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. How yeah. was he interviewing Morris Day? It was really interesting <laughs> um, because we interviewed him a couple times. I was out in L.A., so yeah. they were making that fishnet mm -hmm. video. 
Um, and we interviewed him in the daytime, and he, you know, he was lovely and you know playful. And I, I love that line mm -hmm. about I was somewhere between what did he say? I'm between four and six. Let's say five. <laughs> five is cool. Five is cool. Did you have a visceral reaction when uh, Jimmy Jam said, you know, I'm just a regular guy? With that kind of hairdo. <laughs> right. Uh, there was just a, 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 right. a contradiction going on there. You should have brought that up. You should have been there. We oh, needed man. you. I, I think that's really who he is, that yes. whole idea of like, you know, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. I'm really lucky. Yeah. You know, yeah, I got some talent. You know, and I, 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 I love sharing what I've been able to accomplish mm. with the people. You know, he, I think mm. he really felt that way. There are a lot of places to go hear music in this town. But I think the one that's played the biggest part in the recent history of the music scene is this one. It's probably the most famous converted Greyhound station west of the Mississippi, thanks to Prince. This is where the club scenes in Purple Rain were shot. There was a lot of tourist traffic here for a while, and in a lot of people's minds, First Avenue became synonymous with Prince and other black bands that played funky music with that Minneapolis sound. But at the same time, there was a radically different kind of sound being created right next door in the significantly less glitzy 7th Street entry. You should have seen it before the renovation. Anyway, the music coming out of this room ultimately brought attention to a new definition of the Minneapolis sound. We've been called everything, you know, good, bad, and otherwise. So, <laughs> sort of, <Especially> ugly. <laughs> sort of, sort of used to hearing all kinds of wild descriptions that I would have never thought of, like post, oh, proto punk, or post psychedelic, or Paisley Park. You know, it just, <clears throat> you know, I, I. We make music. I know that. <laughs> you know, that much I do know. Whiskerdoo is the only uh, alternative to people who really want to experience rock and roll right now. If you want to go out and dance, all the dance bands now, it's all high technic stuff. Big Floyd, they got pigs floating overhead. Whiskerdoo interacts with the audience. It's the only place where people can go out and really feel the music and experience what's going on with the band. I think they're great. They play with a lot of heart and a lot of belief and a lot of integrity. And I don't think you can ask for anything more than that for music. They used to be the worst band in Minneapolis. They used to suck. They used to come and yell at them. But now, they're one of the best, if not the. Why? Because they did it all by themselves. They just kept on building. They got in a van and kept touring. Everybody else that I've come in contact to has never, ever done it by themselves. They've always had some, somebody behind them. You know, some, some money makers. What's it like playing in Europe? It's uh, sort of like playing over here in the United States, except you're in a different country. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> no, I was going to say, say a different planet. <laughs> no, it's um, I, I don't know. A lot of times, the you know the, the people that show up at the shows are are Europeans. They, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're speaking a different language. They don't so. want to borrow dollars. They want to borrow lira. No. Uh, there was a lot of good music going on in the late 70s, you know, a lot of the punk rock stuff and the new wave and the art thing and all that weird stuff. You could play any kind of music you wanted just as long as you meant what you were doing. What can I say? I, I think that they're really a phenomenal band of incredible energy and uh, 
uh, both in terms of their productivity, their uh, eagerness to stick at it regardless of, uh, of how much money they make, um, and their ability to write new songs. Uh, I th you know, I, I think their worldview is a little limited, but I think Flaubert's worldview was a little limited too. Uh, <laughs> It's nice to be on the Dean's list. I mean, many people would say, and I think I might agree with them, that they're the best American band of the 80s. But even that isn't saying that much. Uh, they're, but they're fine, pop band, you know. He's a fool. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. <laughs> The general climate is real conducive to people being creative. You know, just the atmosphere around here, it's real positive. You know, there isn't a lot of backbiting and stuff like that. Nobody's pulling favorites in this town. Nobody's, like, really competing against each other unless it's on a real good-natured level. You know, it's the Midwest. <laughs> you know, we gotta be, gotta be honest here. I mean, it's hard work and all that stuff. You know, it's really true, I think. It's a weird thing. People could take this the wrong way, but we're awfully good at what we do. We're, we're awful good musicians, and we're good songwriters, and we're good people. And this is what we do the best, so this is what we work at the hardest. You know, and if, if you're good at what you do and you work real hard at what you do, you, you find the reward from that. Do broke up? Why? Uh huh. Did you talk to Warner Brothers? I mean, did they have any explanation? Artistic, yeah. They always say artistic differences. The late 70s, early 80s new wave period in the Twin Cities spawned a lot of bands that livened up the local club scene for years. The two bands that really made a name for themselves nationally and eventually signed with a major label are the now defunct Husker Du and the replacements. I love their attitude, I love the music. You never know what they're going to do. So I like the replacements before they got really big. Because I don't know, their heads got really big or something. So I went to their last show and they were just drunk and they weren't any good. If getting someone's attention is the key to uh, being successful in the recording industry, I'm sure the replacements will have a big future, a big uh, future in the recording industry, because they're nuts. I think I've seen them uh, destroy more equipment than uh, any other band in, in the record industry. Oh, I hate them. <laughs> why? You really want to know why? Are any of you guys the replacements? No, no, no. Because they, they don't know how to play guitars, they don't know how to sing, they don't know how to do anything. They're just guys who pick up guitars and then all of a sudden they're famous. I wish that would happen to me. The replacements, you guys are sick. These guys have quite a reputation. A lot of people say they're successful in spite of themselves. I was really looking forward to meeting these wild iconoclasts. The replacements probably grew up in a neighborhood that looked a lot like this one. Or, or this one. Or, or maybe this one. If one were to interview them, they'd, they'd probably say that um, growing up here, they felt they had the freedom to play whatever they wanted, and that this town was really supportive because nobody really cared, or, or something like that. And, and maybe we could even see some parallels with Prince. I don't know. The only parallel that I can see is that neither of them would grant me an interview. Their lawyer says it's because they're obstreperous. Obstreperous? That's what he gets paid for, words like that. He gets paid by the letter. I don't know. I guess they just don't like TV. If Paul Westerberg doesn't want to make a video, you know, we're not going to force him to make one. We certainly wanted to make a video. We thought it was a good way of marketing the band. But we eventually made a video um, on their terms.
The visions are a lot more mature than I think most people would give them credit for. I mean, you know, Paul writes songs I think a lot of more mature artists only wish they could write. I think they're, they challenge themselves. It may have something to do with, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about the Minneapolis scene, with not being from a major city like L.A. and not, not trying to fit into certain molds that are created in, in scenes like Los Angeles and New York. In order to play clubs out here, maybe you have to be a specific kind of group. Um, I think they're able to, like, invent themselves up there um, without any encumbrance from big record companies and, and, you know, seeing bands running around limousines and stuff like that. It's just, it's like a nice place to develop. And hopefully, you know, the scene won't change much so we can get more bands like this. Good afternoon and welcome to Power Link and Mercury. It's nice to have you with us. There's a couple of cars that I would like to show you. Before we get to the big ones upstairs... I asked myself the same question. Why is this guy selling me a car in the middle of a documentary about the Minneapolis music scene? Well, as it turns out, there's an intimate connection between this Twin Cities car dealership and the tremendously successful family pop band, The Jets. The Jets aren't from Minneapolis, they're from a Polynesian island called Tonga, but they became associated with the Minneapolis music scene in 1984 when they hooked up with their manager, Don Powell. And here's where the car connection comes in. Sells as many cars and trucks as we do, and a lot of it has to do with how we treat you when you come in. Before achieving fame locally as the TV spokesperson for his family's car dealership, Don was Stevie Wonder's manager at Motown and also claims responsibility for talking David Bowie out of wearing a dress. Somebody had to do it. This is where Don discovered the Jets, in the lounge of the Sheraton Northwest Hotel in Brooklyn Park. Actually, they went by the name of Quasar then and did top 40 covers in a sort of grass skirt Polynesian review. They called me at the Ford dealership several times, and each time I said, say, look, I'm out of the business, I'm, I'm out of the music business, I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing now, and, uh, and it wouldn't do any good for me to see you anyway. Well, they literally found, called me at a time when, which has probably happened to you, you pick up the phone and you can't think of an excuse at that time. And, and they were playing close to where I live, so okay, fine, I'll come over. And, uh, and I had to talk a friend of mine into coming along too. I said, look, we'll only stay one set, I promise, and we're out of there. So we uh, went over to see him and uh, stayed for the set. And on the way out to the parking lot, I, I said, this is the one right here. Within a year of meeting Don Powell, the grass skirts were gone, Quasar was transformed into the Jets, and the group had a hit album out on MCA Records. Crush on you got a lot of uh, pop play, and then you got it all just exploded, and took it to platinum. And anytime you can, you can do upwards of I'd say three hundred thousand on a new act as a record company, you're very very happy. And platinum was just like beyond anybody's dreams. <laughs> I think the Jets' image is good old, all-America, family fun. It hasn't hurt that we have had a Republican administration for the last few years because that sort of embodies what the Reagan administration has been about. It's real accessible stuff, I mean, it, it, to, to everyone. Hey, here, 
master you photographer there. That's what I'm <laughs> Sure. Okay. 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 They're very happy here. They can go to the, the shopping mall and people will smile at them or wave at them, but they won't attack them, which is what happens in New York or Los Angeles. They, they, get, they get mobbed, and sometimes it can be a little frightening. It doesn't happen here. This is just everyone knows who they are. They appreciate who they are, but they, they also respect their own privacy. I wouldn't think of, of moving our operation to Los Angeles or New York. Just uh, it, It's just so comfortable being here. There, there are so many other bands in this town, bands that haven't made it on the scale of, say, the Jets or, or even the Replacements, but they're creating really original music that's an important part of what the whole Minneapolis music scene is all about. How can I possibly do all these bands justice with only 7 minutes and 40 seconds left in the show? Well, um, I think we've got enough time for the Wallets and Ipso Facto, and then, I don't know, we're, we're just going to have to save the rest for the Minneapolis Sound 2 or something. James Brown, he swears by Lincolns. I don't know. Lincolns, they don't make a wagon. We need something bigger. Oh, I'm, I'm stuck. Well, we went to Illinois last weekend. All along, we've been out to California, New York, wherever they hang the little carrot. There's a place to mount the carrot right on the front of the hood, and then the car just follows wherever you, it works. I want to go to Hollywood, I want to be a star, I want to be on Johnny Carson, I want to drive a Porsche, I want to fly to Rio, I want a bodyguard, I want to make millions, I want to throw a party. If we're in New York and playing a club, people go, wow, accordion, and they just, I mean, it's really a, a treat and a novelty. But if we're in South Dakota, it's, you know, that's what all the, the kids who are watching us, that's what their dad plays, so it's like, oh, come on. Let's go! One agent came out, loved the band, and then he said, um, the one thing I have to do is I have to go back to New York, and then uh, the next time you play, I've got to bring out this somebody. But, uh, Unless he hates you, we think we have a, an offer. So he brought this somebody out and he hated us. So we didn't, uh, we didn't even have an offer. Oh my God, Nick Davis is back at um, All My Children. Who's Nick Davis? Remember Nick, he owned the nightclub? Oh yeah. They're totally nude. Uh, uh. They're totally naked. As much as a headache as, as a lot of the business end of it is, and what are we going to do, and is it going to be a success, and am I ever going to be able to put on my 40-piece um, accordion band show at Carnegie Hall, and I mean, there's a lot of things I want, but I, re I feel really grateful to be able to be doing this, and I genuinely just, I, you know, have a lot of fun. That's probably the most important thing, is to enjoy what you're doing, so here I am. black people in the town we lived in.
town of 9,000 people, and 14 black people was my mom, dad, and their 12 kids. What kind of music did you grow up listening to? Yes, what was all that stuff? Everybody's doing the thing. Come on, baby, do the locomotion. <laughs> Growing up in Worthington, Minnesota, Listen to all this I stuff. listened to more rock and roll. I grew up on Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yeah, that too. <laughs> A lot of the record companies want you to play what they think is selling. And, and there was Prince, The Time, Jimmy and Terry. Then there's the other set of A&R people who want to hear who's could do that sound of things. And we're kind of right here in this world beat place where we either have to go that way, that way, or continue to stay and create our own sound. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we've landed. You know, as we're in the place where we'll just have to stand up and fight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just keep playing it the way we play it, and as we develop, this is an Ipso groove. It's not a funk groove, it's not a rock groove, it's not a blues groove, it's a, a Ipso groove. My mother was a soldier. Oh, yeah. She had her hands on the freedom plow. Oh, yeah. One day she got so old, she could not fight anymore. She had to stand there and fight on any glory, hallelujah. We are soldiers in the army. In Jazan. We got to fight. We got to fight. Oh, although, although we, we have, have to die. die. We've got to hold. We got to hold oh, it up. Oh, the blood stained banner. Oh, we got, got to hold it up until we die. Until we die. Until we die. Until we die again. Yeah. <laughs> What's supposed to happen here is I'm supposed to come up with the conclusion, the part that reviews everything that you've seen and, and tells you what it all meant with a, with a capital M. Okay, um, I guess the thing that really strikes me is the incredible variety of music coming out of this town. I mean, it's really pretty hard to define the Minneapolis sound because there are so many distinctly different sounds here. This isn't sounding like much of a conclusion. Maybe I need something a little more poetic, like uh, the Minneapolis sound is not a black sound. It's not a white sound. It's the sound of all humanity singing in harmony. In, in the wrap-up, you say it's not a, a white music scene or a black music scene, but as a watcher, I definitely saw a black music scene, and then, like, yeah. at the halfway point, it was like, and here's Husker Du. Right. And I was just yeah. like, oh, this is... Right turn. Yeah, this is where we go into the white music scene? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I filming mean, it, how did that feel, or how did yeah. that look to you? I mean, you know, they... I mean, it, this town has always had its, you know, racial divide. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it hasn't always been talked about, but mm -hmm. it has always been there to some extent. So, you know, that's why people didn't know about Prince in South Minneapolis when right. I moved here kind of thing, you know? <laughs> Um, but I think all of these things, I think what's happened over time is that there's been much more crossover mixing. and mixing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious for, for you, Bianca, if you could encapsulate oh, uh, Minneapolis music, you Ooh. know, from your experience and your upbringing, what would you, what would you say it is if you could put it into words? Just kind of like my dad's name, Jelly Beans. Okay. So it's just a bunch of us doing a lot of different things, a lot of different flavors, a lot of different colors, mm -hmm. but we all are in this beautiful jar called Minnesota. Oh, there you go. Oh, that is beautiful. beautiful. That, is beautiful. that is beautiful. That is us. I love that. <laughs> that was a great way to put it, yeah. Let's uh, redo the documentary and you can do that and voice over part. Okay. okay. As a six-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> right, that would be even cuter. <laughs> um, did you originally intend to narrate the documentary? I don't remember. <laughs> Um, I think I think the main reason was that, I mean I know the main reason why I decided to go that route mm -hmm. was because I did not want it to appear like this was the be all and end all yeah. um, telling of the story because yeah. different people you know other people would say why isn't this band in here why isn't mm -hmm. that band in there why'd you spend so much time on these people you know that kind of thing so for me it was a way to say this is my exploration yeah. this is my yeah. take on what this is you know what I'm seeing so that's why I wanted to kind of connect the dots that way. I loved it. It worked for me. Good. It I'm worked. glad to hear it. I, I'm alternately embarrassed and um, oh that hair. But anyway, I'm all, I'm all, it was uh, you the know, 80s. It was the Give 80s. yourself <laughs> some grace, girl. It was the 80s. Yeah. No, but I, I'm alternately embarrassed and 
and proud of it, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I do think that it was fun to write like that. You know, yeah. I like the I like the writing, and I, I haven't done something like that really since. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun to have your personal voice carry something, so you can you can do things, you can be nimble yeah. and do wacky, funny things that you can't do if you're you know doing your voice of God narration kind of right. thing, yeah. or or yeah. no narration, you know, which is what I tend to do, no no narration and let the subjects speak for themselves, mm -hmm. which is powerful. Yeah. But you can do some interesting, fun things mm -hmm. this way. But I think all the interviews were really. Um, really fun. The hardest one was the Husker Du one because I didn't know at that time that they were like in the process of breaking up. Oh, oh, no. So there was all this really, Yeesh. it was one of the most awkward shoots I've ever been on. I could feel the something. Was was yeah, and I'm like, what oh, is no. going on? The body language is weird and you know, it was, it was very strange. So then it made sense like, okay, that's why, it wasn't me. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> was feeling this, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course Bob Mould has gone on to you know do tons of solo albums yeah. and super successful and yeah, and Grant Hart just died recently. So it's like, it's, it's bittersweet to mm. look at this and think about the people who aren't here anymore, you right. know, too, and the, and the gifts they gave this town. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Emily Goldberg and Bianca Rose, thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to seeing the next stuff that you do down the road. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for watching and joining us today.